Hello, I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro, and I'm on the board of trustees of the International Menopause Society. And today I'm thrilled to be joined by Dr. Peter Schnatz, who is going to be talking to us about hormonal therapy and cardiovascular disease. Firstly, Peter, can you tell our audience who you are and where you are from? Absolutely. Thanks, Marla. My name is Dr. Peter Schnatz. I'm the Associate Chairman and Residency Program Director in the Department of OBGYN at Reading Hospital Tower Health uh, and on faculty at Drexel University. Um, also part of IMS and am currently Chair of the Educational Committee at the International Menopause Society. So great to be here. And it's great because the message by talking to someone like you is that we are not talking to a cardiologist about heart disease. We are speaking to a menopause practitioner about heart disease. So from your perspective, why is it important for us to think about heart disease in the women that we are seeing? Yeah, this is um, such an important topic, uh, Marla, as you allude to here, is heart disease is the number one killer of, of women. And, um, you know, I think that a lot of times, many women don't know that. And, and if we ask women what, what they're most worried about, it's cancer, uh, breast cancer is usually the number one on their list. But um, heart disease is often not even on their radar. Uh, as physicians, hopefully we know the fact, but I think sometimes we may know it in theory, but we don't um, practice as if it is truly the number one killer. And that's why this is so important to keep it at for, forefront in our minds that um, one in five women die from heart disease. Yeah, you know, we think about the gender bias or the fact that heart disease historically has been known as a male disease. Uh, but I think we all recognize that that is no longer true. So right. where did the notion come from and how, how do we really, you know, continue to break down those doors? Because we do see that there still is that gender bias and women are treated differently, even in presentation to an emergency room. Right. Yeah, and I think it was uh, in the 2009-10 range when heart disease actually surpassed um, the number in, in men so that, mm -hmm. that it became more common in women than in men, which uh, again, I think a lot of people forget, forget that. Um, and so why is it when a man goes into the emergency room, um, he, the first thought is heart disease, uh, but yet when a woman goes in, it's often not. And I think one of the things is that it is more common that heart disease can be an atypical presentation in women. It, it, we know that there are times where it may present with vague symptoms, uh, fatigue, malaise, nausea, maybe the presenting symptom, uh, which is a little bit unique and different from men. Uh, but still, we need to have it on our radar and we need to keep in the forefront, you know, the risk factors. What should women be looking at in terms of risk factors and risk prevention? So let's focus a little bit on, on risk factors and particularly midlife women and integrating that with how, where they are in terms of their menopausal transition can impact on their cardiovascular risk. Right, so what are the, the classic risk factors? Um, hypertension, uh, diabetes, uh, hypercholesterolemia, uh, family history, um, smoking, uh, and then there's assorted um, uh, other ones uh, in activity and, um, and things that go along with it. But the, of the classic ones, obviously some of those we can't um, change our family history. Um, uh, but there are some things that we can impact. We can exercise more. We can uh, uh, look at our diet and we can stop smoking. And so there are a number of things that we can do to help decrease the risk of developing diabetes or getting that under control if it does uh, present. So let's talk about menopausal hormone therapy and cardiac disease. You know, we often talk about the fact that Estrogen is the reason that women present a decade later than men for heart disease. Yet many women are very fearful about the role and, and not understanding that although there is no true indication to use menopausal hormone therapy for the prevention of any chronic disease, there are some cardiovascular impacts, both in starting, making that decision, and then what one can expect to see. So how do you, you know, counsel practitioners when we're assessing women, what should be top of mind? Yeah, and this is incredibly important because, um, as we know, the vast majority of women, 85 to 90 percent, are going to have menopausal symptoms. Most of them, vasomotor symptoms, night sweats, but in a sundry of 
uh, symptoms, including fatigue and poor sleep and um, uh, trouble with uh, sexual relations, uh, pain, uh, vaginal dryness, bleeding. So the, the number of symptoms that women can experience are numerous. And most of these can be helped with hormones. So if women or practitioners feel that they can't use it, we're really jeopardizing women's quality of life in general. Uh, but then again, as you mentioned, there's the whole um, uh, phenomenon of age and when we started and risks and, and how risky is it and that sort of thing. So that's why this is important because we don't want to, to take away the, the opportunity for our patients to have their quality of life. So the topic though of menopausal hormone therapy in relationship to coronary artery disease, you know, when we looked at the Women's Health Initiative, clearly the outcomes differed by the ages that we adjudicated. Younger women did better, older women <clears throat> did not do as well. So, you know, when patients ask you or, or uh, healthcare practitioners look seeking education from you and says a simplistic question like, is hormone therapy and uh, beneficial or detrimental for coronary artery disease? I'm so glad I get to ask the question and not answer this question. <laughs> you can wrestle with that one, Peter. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think first thing to keep in mind is remember in the overall outcome of the, the WHI, there was a little bit of confusion because when it was first reported, um, it was actually republished um, about a year later after the final adjudication of all the data. But interestingly, in that report, there was no statistically significant difference. It was slight increased risk of uh, heart, heart events in the women on hormonal therapy. And that included women on, on estrogen and progestogen, um, slight increase, but it was not statistically significant. Now that's all comers again, women aged um, 50 up to age 80. Um, mm -hmm. But as you were alluding to, as we started to break this down into the different um, categories, first of all, in the women on estrogen only, very different outcome. Um, lower risk, again, not statistically significant. But as we look at the younger compared to the older age, very different results. So those mm -hmm. in the, the 50 to 59 age group, we saw a much lower risk and with that risk beginning to progressively increase as women were older. So now let's look at, at you know, earlier on in our reproductive years. So when we look at women who have premature ovarian failures, so let's say younger than 40, or we're looking at women between 40 to 45 with early menopause, does, does that change our appreciation for the role of estrogen and cardiac? Yeah, and so remember also that there are four FDA approved indications for hormonal therapy, not only the vasomotor symptoms, not only GSM, not only mm -hmm. prevention of bone loss, but premature hypoestrogenism. Right. And this is a whole different category um, because many of our patients and providers get confused with this topic and, and have kind of labeled hormones as bad a woman coming in at age 40 who has had a, a surgical menopause or POI uh, or some other reason that she's hypoestrogenic is not that same patient who was 60, 70, 80 years old that was in this study. Right. Those women really need to be on hormones for many reasons, at least until the average age of menopause for their bone health, for their cardiovascular health, for their mentation for all these uh, things that we know that at, at this younger age, when women are healthy and the blood vessels are healthy, the, endothelial, the, the uh, endothelial activity within the vessel is still reactive and where there may be some uh, uh, potential to keep the vessel healthy during those younger years is really important. So before I let you go, um, you know, often many health practitioners don't recognize that there is actually a signaling between the vasomotor symptoms that women have and correlating it with the risk of coronary artery disease. So it's a fascinating topic. I'd like you to speak to that. It, it is a fascinating topic and there isn't a lot of hard data. It's a, it's a hard prospective randomized study to do, right? Um, but it is interesting and, and it's a little bit challenging, especially with some of our prospective data because um, looking back, it makes sense. Why, why did we 
um, eliminate some of the women from the WHI and the HERS that had hot flashes because we thought it was going to unblind them. Uh, we weren't really thinking about some of these timing hypotheses issues at the time. <clears throat> but if you think about a, what is a hot flash <clears throat> is basically the, the, the blood vessel vasodilating, allowing blood to rush through those vessels and then the sensation of a hot flash. So could it be that the presence of a, of a vasomotor symptom, i.e. the presence of healthy blood vessels um, in response to noxious stimuli such as uh, hypoxemia, nitrous oxide release and so forth is a, is a marker for healthy vessels and, and the stage in life where cardiovascular protection may be amenable uh, versus when uh, the vessels have become stenotic and have lost the estrogen receptors and have lost the ability to vasodilate um, now it's at a stage where um, there is no ability to, to have any beneficial role, but, uh, but on the contrary, potential uh, detriment. So, you know, do we have the beginning of information, certainly studies that have come out of the United States, looking at a correlation between hot flashes as a marker for cardiovascular benefit or cardiovascular risk? Say that again. So do we have information Looking at data that women who are early hot flashers compared to women who aren't hot flashers, is that a marker of cardiovascular risk in any way? So yeah, that, you know, there is data starting to come out um, that's showing that more severe vasomotor symptoms and more, more menopausal symptoms in general, not only vasomotor symptoms, but other symptoms, uh, fatigue and some of the other symptoms we talked about that those women are at higher risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, and that's, that's a, a really interesting topic because you know why is that? And it seems to be a little bit different question than what we were just talking about in terms of um, women with hot flashes maybe being uh, in a place where there's a cardioprotective mm -hmm. uh, role. But why is it that women with more significant symptomatology are at higher risk for heart disease. And that's some new data that's coming out and that we really need to start looking into. You know, I think it's really important and really highlights the, the topic that, that, you know, primary care, obstetrics, gynecologists, endocrine, wherever you are in the spectrum of taking care of menopausal women, estrogen plays a very significant role in terms of cardiac, either pro or con, depending on age. And I think that as we go forward, that blending of recognizing the importance of heart health in relationship to menopausal hormones, stage, POI, it's complex, but something that we need to focus on. Exactly. And I think, you know, one important takeaway is there are a lot of gray areas where even, as you know, if we sit in a room with 10 of us experts, we'll, we'll debate it. You know, you have, should you use it in a patient without symptoms for bone protection? versus another? Should you, in a patient with uh, past breast uh, cancer, and when is it safe? And all these kind of nuances. But the important message is, in a young, healthy woman, without a contraindication, it is exceedingly safe. And in the premenopausal patient, they really should be on hormonal therapy, at least until the age of, of natural menopause. And certainly within that age group, reassuring cardiac data as well. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Great to see you.